All right, here we go. Do we get to the Winter Rouge? Yes. The Winter Rouge, the River Rouge. Oh yeah, we got the River, River Rouge. What is it called when the government cuts spending at a time of debt deflation during depression that lengthened the depression? Yes. What they call? What's the name for it? There's a name. There's a name. Austerity. Yep. And that's because what was happening to government tax revenues? What happens every time there's a depression? They drop because people aren't spending as much money. It's one of those things where governments don't operate like people do. You, they want to kind of they, they want to cut spending when tax revenues are up. That's time to cut spending. When tax revenues are down, that means the economy is bad. They cut spending, makes things worse. It's one of those kind of weird. You know, governments are not the same as people. You notice I'm showing you that by doing this. And what did people begin to lose faith in? System. Yeah, we got government, the system, and don't forget they lost faith in themselves. How many people just gave up, abandoned their families? There'd be so many families abandoned by usually the husbands who felt they couldn't care for their family anymore and felt like a total failure. And yes, that is not thinking rationally, but that's part of the whole thing. And what did Roosevelt suffer from? Probably polio. What coin is he on because of this? Did I tell you that? So Roosevelt is going to raise a lot of money for polio vaccine research, which would eventually come about in the 1950s, one of the more remarkable feats in American history. Also a different era. Jonas Salk, who invented the, the vaccine, gave the patent away because he thought it would be such a cruel and inhumane thing to all the patent that would save so many lives, personal profit. Wow, that is so much different than today. Because now the most patents are owned by pharmaceutical corporations, so it's a different world. But back to this. So they would raise money. One of the things they would do is they go through and they collect dimes, and they called it the March of Dimes. They would collect money for, for polio research. And Roosevelt was such, as you can imagine, big supporter of this. After he died in 1945, he would be put on the dime. Sort of with the dime, that's Roosevelt because of this. All right, so we got to River Rouge, he got elected. We got revolt in the farm, we got bank failure. And the thing about it is, is Hoover very consciously made it worse. And this is one thing that Hoover's going to spend after his whole life trying to say Roosevelt did. Hoover actually consciously tried to contribute to the bank crisis. He made sure that the Treasury Department did nothing to try to backstop banks, to try to provide them with financial relief. He wanted the banks to fail. He wanted Roosevelt to fail. He told people that he wanted the country to realize what a terrible mistake they made by electing Roosevelt and come back hat in hand and beg Hoover to come back and take it over. I told you I was right. And that should tell you a lot about what type of person Herbert Hoover was. And so he tried to force Roosevelt, who was still waiting at Albany. Remember, he was the governor of New York still. And the way they said it is, he tried to hamstring Roosevelt by trying to keep to make Roosevelt sign an agreement to keep Hoover's financial policy. When Roosevelt was specifically elected to almost completely reverse it and do things like get more money in circulation and to regulate banks. And Hoover tried to get him to sign this. Roosevelt refused. And then there's been a myth spread by Hoover that Roosevelt purposely did nothing during this time, which is simply not true. And I've heard lots of people say this, that Roosevelt did nothing during this time. Uh, most famously in 2009, when uh, President-elect Barack Obama said that. And it was like, no, you're completely wrong. But that kind of irritated me at that time. I don't even know what it means when I say hamstring. Ah, right. Don't do that. Don't do that. Unless they really just no, no, don't do that. So there's a couple of Hoover bills right here. And so when FDR did his inauguration, I'm going to change this. I made a mistake on this. I'm 
Huh? Are you enjoying this? Are you enjoying the creative process? That's righteous. I didn't know I was using righteous font. That's totally cool. There we go. Ta da! Just imagine that you can see the end, okay? And so when FDR did his inauguration address that March of 1933, everybody was listening on the radio. And people were scared. It looked like the whole thing was collapsing and about ready to fall apart. Especially to tell you about the assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it just seemed like this might be the end. And with the rise of fascist governments in Europe, it looked like this might be the end of the democracy, too. And there are a lot of people, especially the very wealthy, were praying for it. We have too much democracy. We have to get rid of it. And so this people were watching, and Roosevelt knew it. And so this inaugural address is one of the more important ones in history. You can rank them up with you know, Lincoln's in 1861. You know, a similar kind of thing with the country appearing like it was over to a slightly rest, lesser degree in 2009 when uh, Obama was elected. And maybe even the last one, because we're still in the middle of COVID, still around, but not near as virulent. OK, so this is from a video called The Great Depression. So I'm going to show you a few clips of it I set up and let's hopefully the, let's hope this works. It's a series that the PBS, the PBS did a while ago, but it's still one of the best on the Great Depression. I really like it. Gore Vidal is a famous author. Maybe. Set him up. LaGuardia would be the But in March of 1933, so, the homeless and the poor lost an advocate in Congress. Defeated in the Democratic landslide, LaGuardia returned to a New York where victims of the Depression camped in cardboard shanties. LaGuardia swore he would give up politics, but few believed he would stay on the sidelines if Roosevelt's New Deal could help the city of New York. History turns a page. President and Mrs. Hoover, leaving the White House after four trying years, greet Mrs. Roosevelt on the portico. The president-elect awaits them in the car in which he and Mr. Hoover will ride to the Capitol together. The retiring president and the new, the man who bore the burdens and the man who now assumes them. And his story... So, one thing about that really quick, Hoover, therefore, was furious. I should have Roosevelt was furious. They hated each other. But Hoover was convinced that Roosevelt was going to destroy the country. The country is over. So he didn't want to go to the inauguration. And he was finally persuaded, you, you have to go, especially at a time like this, it would make the country look so divided. And it would look so petty and weak if you don't go, like you're just such a bad loser. And only a few presidents have not gone to the inauguration of their successor. And that's part of the reason. It kind of makes him look like there's something going on. Like John Adams and John Quincy Adams, who's in the family. Andrew Johnson was one. And uh, President Trump didn't go to his successor's inauguration. And so Hoover was convinced. And the thing about Roosevelt, obviously he's sitting there waiting in the limousines, they ride together, that's the tradition. When, when, Roosevelt, or when Hoover sat down, Roosevelt did what he always did. He's in, he was incredibly charming. He just had this gift to talk to people, kind of bring them in and make them feel good about themselves. There's so many stories about people coming in angry at Roosevelt, and he just totally disarmed him with just a few words. My favorite one is the age we're talking about, his most, his most important age, Harry Hopkins. We're talking about a member of Congress who would come into Roosevelt's office, into the executive office, and say, We were trying to propose a bill, why don't Roosevelt support for something? And he would talk to him for a while. And that congressman would walk out thinking two things. Number one, Roosevelt agrees with me completely. And number two, I have a new best friend. Mm -hmm. And his name is Franklin Roosevelt. And then the next congressman would walk in the exact opposite position on the same bill and would walk out thinking two things. Number one, Roosevelt agrees with me completely. And number two, I have a new best friend. What an amazing gift. And so he just knew he did. So Hoover sat, sat down, 
And Roosevelt started talking to him. You know, doing his little charm. And Hoover's just now look, this is what his uh, Roosevelt's son said was sitting in the front seat. Hoover just and Roosevelt said a couple of things. Hoover. And finally, Roosevelt said one more thing, and Hoover just when the car just started taking off, and Hoover just goes, Brah! And that's all Hoover would say. One grunt. And Roosevelt's like, I won. Historical moment in the life of a nation is approaching. Watching and listening. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. What a great sounding voice. And the big thing about this address is Roosevelt came out there from the very moment he gave that speech and said, we're going to do something. We are going to act and we're going to act aggressively now. We're no longer going to ignore the plight of the people in this country who are unemployed and feel forgotten. And he made it very clear. But let me read you a couple other parts of this speech because it was a brilliant speech. You can have the rough draft is at the at his um, his library at High Park, uh, New York. And it's got his writing and you can see it all handwritten. But let me read you a couple of the lines and people are listening. They're sitting around the radio, watching the radio. What else do you do when you listen to the radio? And they want to be reassured. They're scared. And don't forget, we have a bank panic going on at this moment. And so there's one line, all of you are better for it. And let me read it, but think in the context of the attitude of the people and the bank panic. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Okay, you've probably all heard you have nothing to fear but fear itself. But now put it in context at the time, saying that we will reestablish it. We've gone through bad times before and we will make this country prosper again. We will do it together. So, Nothing to fear, but fear itself. It's like, huh? But put it in the context of a bank panic and it looked like the society was breaking down. It makes sense. Pretty brilliant. And then a very important thing he does is he lays blame. He lays blame on the people who caused this. Now, you can agree or disagree, but the people wanted the president to not be wishy-washy or not try to protect friends who made mistakes, like bankers and speculators. He laid blame. And there are people of his class. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. Now may, we may restore that temple to the ancient truths. The measure of this restoration lies in, to the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. The money changers are the bankers, the speculators, greed, not the workers who are laid off, it's greed. And we will stop this. It's important to assign blame. As long as, you know, you're assigning blame to the right people and saying that we will resolve this. Happiness lies not in the mere possession of money. It lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort. The joy and moral stimulation of work no longer must be forgotten in the mad chase of profits. And so he laid it out. It was great. And that's what people wanted to hear. It was a brilliant speech. And when it was done, it was kind of shocking, the reaction. The energy that was let loose right after that inauguration was enormous. Washington had never known anything like it. Stylistically, there was just this uh, uh, abundance of, of movement and activity and uh, a sense of let's get on with the, with the problem. And you felt that this guy came and he's going to save the people. And a tremendous feeling for him. Holy hell, and people are going to kiss his, his toenails. That's how much they love this guy. 
I think he was primarily a person who was convinced that there was poverty in the country, need in the country, and he wanted to do something to help. And so I love that guy when he says, he just, we love him so much, we want to kiss his toenails. He loved Roosevelt so much. And Roosevelt represented hope to so many people. Of course, the people who hated him despised him. This is a great cover of a relatively new magazine at this time called The New Yorker. I got a look, party space compared to Roosevelt. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty true. But this optimism that Roosevelt had, at the same time, we're going to work. So this will be known as the first New Deal. And it's going to be a series of laws, kind of a hodgepodge. He talked about this. He said he would do these things, but still they were so revolutionary new. Some were still theory. Some have been done to a lesser degree in other countries. We didn't know. And a, there was a wave of laws that would be passed. Eventually, in those 100 days, 13 major laws, 10 new agencies would be created. Roosevelt understood in those first days, there's kind of a honeymoon. The people are desperate. There's a huge Democratic majority. Conservative Democrats, especially from the South, were cowed and nervous to go against Roosevelt. So they could get a lot of things passed. Every president has this bit of a honeymoon. I should add, virtually every president would blow it. And I use it properly. Almost, they almost all do. But presidents have this honeymoon. The, the current president used it a little bit and they kind of let it go to waste. But at first came and got a couple bills passed. They always have a little bit of a honeymoon. So many of these new agencies will be known for its acronyms. And you can see with all the acronyms here, you have a few on your test. That's why they called it the alphabet soup. And a couple of things about it. he would be willing to do about any program possible. And he was really kind of mixed. He had a lot of advice from different people that they dubbed the brain trust. And some were, we need to have more control of the economy. Some were, we need to break up more monopolies. What kind of regulation? What do we do about farmers? They have all these different ideas. But one constant, like the populace before him, it was to save capitalism. Capitalism as they saw it. The unregulated capitalism of the 1920s led to this crash and led to the growth of fascism and communism all over the world. And we got to find this middle road to save capitalism and regulate it or it will blow itself up. And so his opponents are going to call him a communist, a Bolshevik. But I should also add that the Communist Party in the United States despised Roosevelt because he saved capitalism. They hated him. And he would dub this kind of middle of the road between ultra monopolized capitalism, AKA fascism, so that'd be on your right, you're on the right, or anarchists or socialism on the left. What's in the middle? He dubbed it, kind of made it up, liberal. And that's where we get the term liberal when it comes for economics. It comes from Franklin Roosevelt. If we go to Europe and call what Roosevelt did liberal, they would look, 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 look at you like you're a lunatic. Because liberal, to our point of view, would be conservative. So it's, it's really confusing over there. But it was a little bit of progressive, but I should have made this bigger. It was more populist. He really went back to the populace. As much as he admired his progressive cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, he was more of an old time populist. I mean, the populist party of the Omaha Convention and William Jennings Bryan, that was his view. And so with that, let's watch a little bit more of the video. So the video then talks about some of the things that happened, lays out a couple bills. So it's gonna go in order of these ones. And I really like how they do it. I love the personal interviews. Yeah. Yeah, when we get to them, we'll write down. So, so the emergency banking bill, I mean, just what very briefly what happened. So, video. Something to help. New York 
had declared a bank holiday for the banks in New York. But uh, Roosevelt followed it up with a bank holiday for the national government and throughout the country. By early 1933, Americans were lining up to withdraw their money from a banking system on the brink of collapse. Roosevelt closed the banks for four days and pushed through an emergency banking bill authorizing $2 billion in new money to help pay off depositors. The new president... So, they gave $2 billion. Basically, the federal government is going to give $2 billion to the banks. So there'll be, so the depositors won't panic. There was no real apparatus set up, and these banks were desperate. And the thought was, yes, we're giving a bailout to the banks, but the whole financial system could crash. And then one more thing they did, they announced during this bank holiday, we will send federal inspectors out to check banks, and we will not let them open until they are safe and have a reserve. And so then when the bank holiday ended, the, the, the hope was people would trust the banks and put their money, put their deposits in. I should add, how many uh, federal bank inspectors do you think there will? Three? Yeah, you're far right. Yeah, virtually none. So this was an illusion. They basically just called each other on the phone. I mean, they didn't have time to inspect. Roosevelt was doing a grand illusion to convince people the banking system was safe. So much of this was to stop the herd mentality, the panic of the bank panic. But here's an important thing he did. That then he went on radio nationwide now. And gave went on radio with the first of his fireside, fireside chats. Chat. And I to want the to tell you what has been done in the last few days, why it was done, and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington. The he made listeners feel as though he were Washington talking to them and to them individually uh, and alone. And this was a remarkable technique that he had. Roosevelt would caress with his voice the microphone. And he treated the people as though they had Intelligence. He treated great Let us unite respect in state. banishing fear. They felt he did. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. And we're all in this together. together we cannot it's, fail. It's an important. Illusion. I remember illusion. in those days, if you went through any area. During the fireside chats, you could hear them walking down the street. You didn't have to worry about getting home in order to hear it because it would be turned on all the way home. We would ourselves sit down and talk over what he had said. And then we would look at what was happening all around about us, but still come out feeling good about it, feeling better than we had felt, with, though we had problems. We were a serious country. The people had something to do with the government, and they felt in Roosevelt they had somebody who understood them, somebody who spoke to them. Other politicians found him uh, uh, mendacious and tricky, which indeed he was, but he was also had a direct pipeline to the people. And when the banks reopened, deposits exceeded withdrawals. Roosevelt had restored confidence, not only in the banks, but in the possibility of recovery. In the first hundred days of the New Deal, Roosevelt and Congress created 10 new agencies to combat the effects of the Depression. The alphabet soup of New Deal programs had immediate impact on the lives of millions of Americans. The first jobs program, the Civilian Conservation Corps, put 250,000 young men to work restoring the nation's forests. And they gave them army surplus uniforms and tents to wear. And young men, there was a massive unemployment of young men, and so it provided jobs. It wasn't that big of a program, but the memory of this is incredibly positive, of people going out and doing this young people 
And they have a legacy of this with the YCC, and there used to be an MCC for Montana Conservation Project, uh, our Conservation Corps. And they did a number of parks. The big thing they do would do is like carve out trails, things like that. Like, um, in fact, I'll just the gates of the mountain was it last summer or something before us off of that Meriwether campground and the trail that goes up and all the campsite was built by the Watkins with CCC. Who's been to the Lewis and Clark cabins? That's CCC. That's who did it. Roosevelt preferred a system of work relief to giving out welfare checks. But the president decided he had to push for direct federal relief or millions would starve. This was a absolutely new program uh, for the federal government to be engaged in, that is to be handing out relief. It wasn't much handed out on, on any level. Uh, and suddenly for it to be a major program with millions of dollars involved, with people getting money for nothing, as it was said by the opposition to it. President Roosevelt has given me the job of administering the $500 million appropriated by Congress under the Emergency Relief Act of 1933 to help care for the 18 million persons whom the Depression has plunged from self-support to public dependency. In his first two hours on the job, Harry Hopkins dispensed $5 million in relief funds. I came to work for the uh, FERA, the Federal Not Emergency checks. Relief Administration, in September of 1933. She's we so were wild. a group of young people. For most of us, this was our first job. And uh, we were terribly wrapped up in what we were doing, very excited about it, felt that the future of the world depended upon us. So there, there was never any, any difference between work in the office and, and being away from the office. When we went to eat or to restaurants or go even taking our wives dancing that hot fall up on the roof of the Power Tan Hotel, very few people danced. They they talked the whole time. We were talking about our jobs. Eleanor Roosevelt would get literally thousands of letters a day. And poor Harry Hopkins would get the brunt of them with my grandmother writing on the top in hand, Harry, can't we do something about this person? So Eleanor Roosevelt, in many ways, is considered like the conscience of the Roosevelt administration, an incredibly intelligent woman. She was a great influence on Franklin Roosevelt. And it's one of those things where you know, women were not expected to be in government or have these positions. So that's how she made her difference. She made a massive difference. And she would get thousands of letters every week. And these letters are really sad, tragic letters of people who suffer through the depression. And she would send them off to Harry Hopkins. Let's do something. And there's been a book published by this really interesting with these letters, but it's also it's kind of hard to read. And the other thing, too, is that she was a tireless fighter for equal rights, not just equal rights about based on color skin, but equal rights for men and women. It was uh, she was a tireless fighter for this. And even though Southern Democrats made sure very little would be passed, her energies, along with the New Deal program, would um, and reverse a trend that African Americans who could vote would vote Republican. They started voting Democratic and still do. Next, Louisa Bounce. With the government programs underway, Roosevelt turned his attention to the private sector. Blue Eagles loyal legions on parade. Soldier and sailor, millionaire and office boy, society maintenance shop girl, elbow to elbow in the NRA Army. 250,000 economic warriors forming the greatest peacetime demonstration in American history. In September 1933, the government sponsored a spectacular parade up New York's Fifth Avenue to promote an unprecedented federal effort, the National Recovery Administration. Roosevelt called the NRA a partnership in planning between government and industry. 
its goal to speed recovery by establishing profit levels for business and wage levels for labor so the nra anybody who entered it got certain benefits but the administration would set up codes and they called them codes for production for wages and for profits so they would try to organize who's going to produce what so the idea would be no more waste and profit and wages not to get too high, not too much money going to profits. And Roosevelt was convinced they could do it like the war production board during World War I. But don't forget, that board failed miserably. There was this myth that it worked, and Roosevelt kind of bought into it. And so there was an initial just wave of enthusiasm, especially for section of the, at this, in the 1930s, everybody knew. If I would have said, section 7C, which meant this was we have to get the NRA allowed. Anybody who entered it, allowed for unions. They must allow for unions. If workers want one, there's a union. That raises wages. And initially, there was huge enthusiasm for it. In a show of national solidarity, more than 2 million employers across the country promise to abide by the NRA codes. The NRA means to me a steady job with more pay, the extra time comes in handy. I got a new job and it's great to be working again. Thanks to President Roosevelt's plan, the NRA, which has made it possible for me to resume my position as a mannequin. I am 100% back of a, a president who is recovery and I want every one of my customers to know it. That might be gone. The NRA also supported the right of employees to form unions and bargain collectively. Garment workers in New York City used the NRA to win higher wages and better working conditions. Okay. Tell me if you know what he said. It was it almost enough for a president of this great nation to take account of us foreigners, which is what all of the union members were practically without any exception. In the sweatshop. And, uh, acknowledge that that things are bad and that workers are permitted to organize we must say that the nra improved our needle industry we are able now to make a living better than any time before we work we work in short hours and get some better pay long live president roosevelt long live president roosevelt so Initial enthusiasm, but by 1934, it was clear that the NRA was not working. It was far too cumbersome. It was too complex. Imagine trying to come up, come up with codes for every single business in the United States. It was just too top-down, too slow to respond. And so everyone got it. It was too complicated. It, it didn't work. And it wasn't supposed to do this, but it started favoring bigger and bigger companies. It favored big. And then the Supreme Court would rule it unconstitutional, its claims. And Roosevelt was actually, even though he was furious at the Supreme Court, he was kind of glad because it wasn't working. So let me get one more thing real quick for the bell rings. One more. There's another program called the AH, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. So this is going to do something about farmers. And there have been since World War I a farm crisis. Farm prices were too high. And of course, then massive debt and foreclosures. And this line right here, right here, that's all the farm foreclosures by 1933. And so it shows how bad it was on the farm, this yellow line here. And so overproduction is the problem. If we can get production down, prices will go up. And so the IAA would pay farmers not to grow. They would tax food processors and pay farmers not to grow, with the idea being you cut down crops prices will go up. And it had actually pretty good success, but there's going to be some waste. That first summer when they're hastily organizing this, you still have a lot of farmers with excess crops and storage or the grain and corn or whatever might be they're growing right now, you know, pigs, cattle, all these things, and they can't get it to market. No one's buying it. And this is one of the problems that, you know, had with capitalism. Capitalism, it's really good at producing products, 
But if people can't buy it, it can't get to the people who need it. And there's so many people starving, you didn't have food. What do you do where you have the surplus of food and no one can buy it? Well, they made a hasty decision to destroy the food. And so they burnt millions of bushels of corn and wheat, just burnt it. They dumped thousands of uh, bushel baskets full of oranges, for example, into San Francisco Bay. They put armed guards around so starving people wouldn't swim out and get an orange. They dumped millions of gallons of milk on the side of the road and slaughtered and burnt the carcasses of cattle, of pigs, of chickens. And this, this will taint the New Deal. People will be talking about this here. Look at all the food they wasted. But this shows the problem. If you just give the food to people, what happens to prices? They go down even more. They obviously should have just took the money and bought the food. She said that the government's going to buy the extra and then distribute it and then worry about the prices down the road. This was a terrible mistake, but the AAA did start to bring prices up, as you can see by the foreclosures beginning to drop by 35. Yeah. So, yeah. They offer that suit and all that was like. Do you think it was like a conscious choice made so it would help people feel more like they could get their game? Just because it's easier to understand names. It, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a conscious effort um, to come up with the acronyms, but that would be the net effect. You're right. And then they would give them something easier to advertise because the the Roosevelt administration went out of their way to push the NRA, the AAA. You would really see it with Social Security, much more successful than like future presidents would do. So that is true. Yeah, FDR, AAA. Yeah, it's a good point. And it didn't apply to sharecroppers. So sharecroppers didn't get money, but their owner, the landlords did. And this is going to be a problem down the road. Eventually, sharecroppers are going to be booted off the land. One thing, though, that tax on food processors would be found unconstitutional. And this one, Roosevelt was furious. And this will begin one of the biggest fights with the Supreme Court since the Jefferson administration in the Marshall Court. Okay, one more thing to write down, and then I'll talk about it tomorrow. Be quick. The TV, just write down the TVA, and we'll don't worry about the rest. We'll do it tomorrow. Sound good? The one thing about this is so cool. All the posters, there's so many really cool posters for the uh, uh, Rose, or during the New Deal. They hired artists to make all the posters for the New Deal are just awesome. My favorite are all the posters they made for the National Virus. Those are the coolest posters. Maybe I'll show you. Remind me, I'll get a few. They're awesome. I did assign the rest of chapter. 25 to finish the new deal chapter Thursday. I'm shutting out the camera. Say goodbye to your television audience. You weren't as enthusiastic as I thought you would be. See ya, sucker.